Hi, I'm Derek Catron, the news editor at FocusWire, and we're here in Barcelona at the FocusRight Europe conference. I'm joined today by Sarah Dines, Chief Commercial Officer at Viator, Lawrence Lorink, the CEO of Tickets, and Travis Pittman, CEO of Tour Radar. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Pleasure. So um, the prominence of experiences has been growing since the pandemic. How much more potential for growth is there in the sector? And can this growth continue at the pace we've been seeing after years of lagging? Um, are our experiences now maybe reaching something of a balancing with, uh, with other sectors like hospitality? Um, Sarah, you wanna go first? Sure. Uh, I, I think there probably is a ceiling at some point someday, but we're very, very far away from that at this point. And I think uh, either focus right or arrival projects the industry to be about 350 billion by the end of 2028, and it's about 100 billion more than it is today. Um, and you know what we see in our own business is an increasing number of activities being done by travelers whilst they're on one trip. And I believe it was earlier this year, Arrival did some research that showed that people have now gone from four experiences to seven per trip. So, you know, the number of things that people are doing and the amount of money that they're spending on experiences is continuing to grow. And so, like I say, I think we're very, very far from a ceiling. Okay. And, uh, Travis, you want to go next? Yeah, I, I think we're on the, the back of the tailwinds from COVID. Uh, people obviously want that more experiential type travel. I mean, for us, we're on organized adventures, which is like an eight day package. So what you're saying every day, you're kind of doing different experiences and definitely people want that more cultural in-depth experiences. So going to Vietnam and cooking with a local or cycling a bike, you know, through the fields and that sort of thing. So people want that and not just going and flopping on a beach for a week. Uh, they definitely want to be a bit more active. Uh, and so I think, yeah, there's definitely a lot of headroom uh, for growth. And have you seen your uh, tours grow in terms of the number of things or the days that people are traveling and wanting to travel or the number of things they're wanting to do on the multi-day tours? I'd say they're, they're booking more of the optional activity. So typically they can obviously get the base tour. And then within that, the guide says, hey, tomorrow we're doing this experience. Uh, would you like to do it? So, and there is a trend that more of those are being booked. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and obviously, yeah, more within a day as well, not just doing one, they're probably trying to pack in a bit more. So, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's actually what we see as well. Uh, it's not necessarily a budget limitation. We talked about it yesterday. Mm -hmm. Sometimes people book so much in advance that they get tired of, uh, of something, so they need to switch their plans on the day. I, I think it's still to answer your question, it's still a very much a Pareto business. So when people visit Paris for the first time, they have their bucket list, right? The things they want to see for the first time. Uh, but what we are seeing at Tickets is that the, the way they want to you know, enjoy the Louvre, the way they want to do a sand cruise, the way they want to do a culinary tour, uh, changes, right? It's, there's a lot more local interaction that's, uh, that's part of it. But also the ways to visit uh, a museum like Louvre is changing. Early morning entry with a tour guide, you know, with, with, uh, with uh, you know, a skip the line entry, a VIP entry. Uh, there's all kinds of uh, diversity there. So I think around the Pareto experiences, there's still a lot of growth there. Uh, covering all the needs from different audiences. Uh, but we definitely see on the bucket list, getting the hidden gems, uh, getting a lot more attention there. Yeah. But it's also the off the beaten path, I think is something obviously, yeah. over tourism is something we all talk about and getting people out of those hubs and into more regional areas in the countryside. Like that's the, uh, the one thing that we're trying to really push is like, you know, developing countries, they really benefit from that community tourism that people come in, the money stays there and so, getting people out of Paris and out of Amsterdam and, and Barcelona into places like Morocco and, and uh, Japan, or not Japan, but actually Vietnam is, is obviously great for, for those local communities. Yeah. 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 As you get farther afield, uh, is it a, how much of a challenge is it to get these experiences online? And um, for those that aren't online, what, what do you think is holding them back? Well, I'll start with you, Travis, since you were just going. Yeah, <laughs> uh, go for it. Uh, we see tour operators, it's, not the most tech savvy industry. Uh, that's definitely what's held it back. Uh, I think there hasn't been the, the technology there in the same way as hotels and flights and everything. We're catching up, you know, I say that our industry is about 10 years behind, uh, so hotels. And I feel there's been some res tech platforms in the day tour space and activities. It's really helped obviously get that out there, but in our multi-day space, there's not really any of that. And so I think it's education that 
giving a commission to a distributor, whether it be a travel agent or an online platform, it's not a sin, you know, you're actually just, you're paying for a new customer. And so for them to get a customer on their own, they have to do marketing, they have to spend with Google, they have to do PR, they have to travel to London to WTM. So I think it's just education a little bit of, of uh, these niche operators who have never had to really do this before. Um, so that combined with technology, I would yeah. say. Yeah. I would agree with that. And then in addition, I think there are a lot of operators out there who don't actually understand that experiences OTAs exist and that they drive an enormous amount of traffic and demand uh, from travellers and we, you know, we spend a lot of money on, on doing that and providing the systems and tools for them to acquire new customers, manage the relationship with customers, manage logistics and all the things that allow them to focus on the tour itself as opposed to the day-to-day -day administration of um, you know, running a business. Yeah, but it's it's still it's still very widespread, right? Even in a let's say a more curated marketplace that, that tickets has, we still need 160 different Restec partners, right, to to sign up the curated assortment, right? Some of them, you know, A level venues, but most of them actually mid and long tail tours and and activities and uh, specials, hidden gems. So it just shows that uh, there's not a single Restec partner that you know you can hook up with. Uh, which you could argue in the hotels industry, in the airline industry, there's just less players, there's less complexity. And, yeah. yeah. So there's still, there's still a lot of work to do, but we're getting there. Yeah, I think it's, I guess, the res tech industry itself is highly fragmented because res techs exist to serve certain, indu certain industries and categories that are optimizing for different things. And then you've got regional differences as well uh, that make it even further complicated. Yeah. And travel styles, like in multi-day, you've got some that have ships, you know, then there's different categories of the berth or the rooms that you're in, and then there's like safari and overland. And so building a res tech for multi-day is extremely complex. Uh, and that's why there's not, I think, anyone who's really nailed it yet. There's some people who are doing it well, but they're, they're sort of focused on a certain style of travel typically. Uh, and so I think there's, you know, over time, you start to crack it, but it's also very everyone is different in a multi-day complex era so uh, area and that's really something that we've just said look we want to be the distribution partner like as to a, to a radar and not try and obviously do the full back end and i think that's where the res tech does need to play a part in building that back end uh, and back office stuff as well yeah. yeah i guess the last thing i would say about that is that covid really brought operators online more rapidly than pre-covid um but ultimately you know consumers want to buy convenience and ease and as more consumers become aware of otas and online distribution channels operators will go where consumers are at the end of the day okay All right. well uh, Lawrence, let me start with you on this one uh the um you know with the experiences booming the way that it is is there more of a, a appeal maybe for companies looking at consolidation in the in the experiences sector. What's your feel on that? Is that something that you think we'll be seeing more of? And, and what are the, you know, the prospects or benefits if there is acquisitions on the horizon? Yeah, that's 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 the million dollar question, right? That's that's something something everyone's looking at. I, I think there's there's let's say if you look at the consolidation path, there's still a lot of things to do. So if you look at the generic travel sellers and the generic OTAs, I think they only recently started exploring this area, right? They're still in the early discovery mode. Uh, if you look at the dedicated OTAs, I think, you know, there's a bit more experience, a bit more uh, of looking back, uh, back at there, but there's still a lot of organic growth to grab there, right? Related to your first question, um, I, st I still think there's a lot of organic things to do there. Uh, so we're not just yet that. So, but I think with the, you know, with the increased attention, if you look at the end user in the end, uh, we talked about this earlier, uh, this convention on what is the order of things, what is the importance of and the reason to make the trip. Uh, and there we see a clear shift, right? If you look at user behavior, if, if you look at user intent, if you look at, we talked about booking windows, right? Uh, people want to secure uh, the less available slots, right, on the on the A-level venues. Uh, we see a bit more in-trip, uh, shorter booking windows on other parts of the assortment. Um, so I think it's it's increasing in importance, but the key players are still playing reasonably, reasonably early in this game. So, okay. yeah. All right. 
Uh, Travis, what do you think? I, I think there is opportunity for consolidation, for sure. Uh, I see in our space, multi-day, it is difficult to get to scale. Uh, so, and you think of the different travel styles there are. So as I mentioned, like it could be safari, it could be sailing, uh, there could be, yeah, uh, cycling holidays. It's difficult to go from just one niche to scale that to more. And, and I think there will be some consolidation of those specialty areas uh, that make sense then to combine into a, a bigger platform then can reach the, the scale. Uh, so, mm -hmm. you know, and there's a question at the end of the day, we talk about day tours and activities and we have multi-day tours from a consumer's point of view, they have no idea what those terms mean. They just want to <laughs> book a, an experience. And I think that's what we probably as an industry need to think about. Is there something that makes a bit more sense for the consumer to just come to one place to, to book everything, you know, in a way, mm -hmm. so, yeah. Any views on that? Uh, I think I just echo what Lauren said, which is it's a highly attractive industry, fast growing. There's obviously going to be movement, but I couldn't possibly speculate on what that movement might be. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, so fast moving, fast growing. Uh, I guess you could look at this next question in two ways. When I ask about growth, it's like, oh, we almost don't have to do anything. It just keeps growing because there's so much interest. <laughs> but I suspect that's not what you guys are doing. Yeah, yeah. So, so that, I, was, I was hoping that wouldn't be the answer because we'd, we'd be done. Um, but so, so Lawrence, when, how do you grow tickets? What's your, what, what's, what are you thinking of, um, you know, for the yeah, next for, year? So? For us, it's been, let's say in the past four or five years, it's been really important to discover a destination-based growth model that works, right? That is predictable, that is repeatable. Um, so about five years ago, we were, I think we were present in 700 different destinations, which might be a number that, you know, for Sarah might be very achievable. Mm -hmm. But for us, there was, um, there was quite a lot. So we doubled down on about 200 destinations where we wanted to test the full model, the full model of maturing a destination. For us, that means uh, go for the Perito experiences first, the things that are on, on everyone's bucket list. And based on that huge volume, there's a huge search index around that, uh, provide the users with other options because mostly the bucket list is bigger than just one or two, right? It's growing to seven if we listen to Sarah, right? So that's, uh, that's quite a lot there. So we've been able to achieve that. Uh, we're doing that in a channel mix that, you know, we're becoming less and less dependent on the Google tags. Um, so it's, um, it's, it's partnerships, it's uh, affiliation. Uh, we've grown our base to, to more than 5,000 partners, and, and that is working really well. We're sharing our uh, bundling, cross and upsell technology in all footsteps of, of the users with these partners. So we're sharing the revenues of that, and that has helped us to grow, uh, you know, tremendously in the past couple of years. And uh, yeah, still, still looking forward to that. Yeah. Travis, how about you? What's, uh... Yeah, so we invested a lot of time and effort during COVID on building out a, a B2B platform because uh, we saw that we work with 2,500 tour operators. Their biggest problem is getting to market. How do we get distribution? And so 90% of this industry is still booked through travel agents and offline, uh, telephone calls, that type of thing. And so we want to enable travel agents. We've had 20,000 sign up already uh, in the last 18 months. Uh, and that's a, you know, great partnerships that we're building to try and bring obviously more customers to, to the tour operators. Uh, but a big one for this year and the next 12 months is also mobile. Uh, so seems very, uh, you know, revolutionary, no, not really in, in 2024, but for our industry it is. Uh, and so we're really combining the Gen AI search experience. How can we reimagine uh, the, how you find one of the 50,000 adventures we have that suits you exactly. And so uh, we've got a dedicated mobile team now that we're really focusing and combining that with uh, reducing reliance on the Google world uh, and obviously looking at social uh, as a way because you know, Google's very good at bottom of funnel, uh, but you know, mid funnel and top of funnel, mm -hmm. social is clearly the place to play there. <coughs> Just super hard to crack, you know? So how do you get people from browsing to actually booking a $5,000 experience. So that's the, the challenge, but one that we're willing to, to take on at the moment. So, okay. yeah. Sarah, this is your opportunity to tell us who's <laughs> taking over at Viator now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> if you'd like, we've, we've got it on. Once again, slash, I couldn't yeah. possibly speculate. <laughs> okay, well, I had to try, right? Yes, um, but, yes, so of course. When, when your revenues are, are making up a larger and larger portion of, uh, of your company's revenues, how do, you, how do you keep that going? That's, uh, that's a, 
Um, well, I think we've been on, as you know, a pretty big growth tra trajectory. And uh, in the first quarter of this year, we did over a billion dollars of bookings. And so still growing year over year. Um, you know, our mission is to bring more wonder to the world. And we do that by really doubling down on having the world's best uh, catalogue of experiences, a 10 out of 10 customer experience, and basically focusing on building our brand and generating more direct traffic, uh, more in-app bookings, reducing our reliance on Google, um, and really leveraging the scale that we have and the efficiencies of that scale. Uh, and solving really important customer problems like logistics, like day off logistics is the number one problem that people have, like where is my guide, where am I being picked up from, that kind of thing. So using our experience to solve those customer problems um, to give that 10 out of 10 experience. Okay. Well, since you brought up Google, I think that's mm. a good, this is my, okay. this is my final <laughs> question. Uh, so uh, are we transitioning to a world in which everything starts with Google Maps now? Um, I mean. What does this new world of Gen AI uh, search mean for people who are trying to find an experience with one of you? And um, you know, and how do you how do you work with with that now? Um, do you want to start? Since sure. Okay. Um, so you know, for I think all of us, Google has been a really important driver of traffic and demand. And in fact, for every company in the world, it has been. I actually feel quite bullish on the fact that Google is going to be not replaced immediately, but it faces some serious competition from things like social. So for example, my 18 year old son is about to embark on a two week trip to Europe and the, he's going with 10 friends and they have not looked at Google at all for what they're going to do. They've only looked at TikTok for what they're going to do. Um, and so I think that, you know, as brands like ours look to diversify traffic from away from Google to social, to um, developing our own brands and investing in our mid and upper funnel, um, developing through partnerships uh, with affiliates and travel agents. I think we, we all do that. Um, mm -hmm and uh, distributing our product, a Vital distributes its product uh, very widely to, uh, through APIs to e-commerce partners like Booking and Expedia. Okay, right. uh, Travis, you wanna go next? What's, uh... Uh, I mean, Sarah said quite a lot there, but absolutely, I mean, that's part of our focus on social. If you actually go into TikTok now, the search, they actually encourage you to search, you know, mm -hmm. so they're really trying to replace and basically tell, you know, Gen Z's and whoever else just don't, you don't even need Google anymore. And so I think that's where we need to optimize. Google won't, you know, go down, you know, without fighting for sure. sure. And so YouTube <laughs> shorts, I think will, will become a thing as well. But uh, on the maps front, I think that's an interesting one from our perspective because we're multi-day. Like if you go to mm -hmm. Mongolia for six days, you have no idea where you're going, like if you actually try and conceptually think about it. So maps are a great way to visualize that. And so seeing the itinerary on a map is actually quite good. So I think there'll be things that uh, they'll innovate around uh, for that type of product. Um, and absolutely, you know, it's, uh, it, it, they will, you know, with the AI overviews and everything like that, they call businesses ads. That's going to obviously be ad space. Uh, you know, it's a new new spot basically, uh, and I think that's where we'll start to have to compete for for those new spots. And organics just going to get less and less. You know, uh, as it is currently today. So, yeah. so Lawrence, we give the last word to you. No, I think I think AI obviously has a lot of uh, has a lot of promise in it. We're not there yet, but you know, it's, uh, it's, it seems to be heading in a, in a useful direction. I think there will be a multitude of partners that allow our users to dream, to plan, you know, to orient wh where do I want to go. Um, I think the good thing about AI is there will be more parties able to, to provide that. I think there's also more parties that will use AI to then provide the right itinerary, not just Google, right? There will be many more partners. If I look at the amount of partners that are investing in that area uh, that we're working with, and you know, for us, we're looking forward to that. We, you know, we own the availability, we own the core data, the core pricing. That in the end, you know, if you want to make it happen, your dream, you uh, you need to have that position, and uh, you know, and that's uh, so we're we're in a good spot there. So I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. Yeah, I think that. Sorry, just to add there on the 
owning the inventory as in the uh, availability and pricing and everything that is something that i think we all have to obviously remember yeah. uh when it comes to i mean Google has shown intent for some areas there, but Absolutely. at the end of the day, the, the merchant record or the booking needs to happen somewhere, mm -hmm. uh, probably not on and Google. Probably not on Google. Yeah, no. uh, and that's where we have to try and obviously leverage that position, I think, you know, so, yeah. Mm. Great. Mm. Hey, thank you all so much for joining us here. I uh, appreciate it, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank uh, you. Thank we you. will. Thank, thank you, you, Derek. Thank you yeah, very thank much. Yeah. Thanks.